there. This is Kara Tierney from Monroe Community College and in this video we're going to continue on the discussion from the last video about naming ionic compounds. We talked about just the basic rules before and now I want to expand on that by talking about some exceptions. There are two exceptions to this basic rule and the first one has to do with when we have a transition metal. Now remember that transition metals are the metals that are in the middle of the periodic table. They're in green here and these metals are special because unlike the other metals we've talked about, uh, these metals are able to actually have more than one charge. Now recall if we looked at something like sodium here, sodium is going to only have the capability to have a plus one charge. Also magnesium would only have a plus two charge. Remember we look at their uh, location on the periodic table to tell the charges of metals that are in the first two groups. Metals that are in the transition area as well as underneath the stair step in this right area, specifically noting tin and lead. So tin and lead I'm including in this discussion of transition metals. They can all have the capability of having more than one charge. So we need to name things a little bit differently than before and I'm going to show you why. So if you looked at something um, with the name of copper iodide and if we wanted to figure out the formula of copper iodide I would have to know the charge of the copper in order to balance the iodines with that copper to figure out what the formula is. Remember that our formulas always have to end up with a neutral charge. However since I know that copper can have two different charges and I don't expect you to memorize those charges uh, but copper can have a plus one or a plus two charge that's going to affect the formula and in fact what that's going to to do is that's going to give us a formula of either CuI for copper with a plus one charge or if copper has a plus two charge it'll be CuI2. So we need to have a way of indicating what the charge is in the name. Now I do want to show you a couple transition uh, metals because of course there's an exception to the exception that often have only the same charge. Silver often only has a plus one charge and zinc usually only has a plus two charge. We're going to run across both zinc and silver quite a bit in this class, so you should probably know those two. So uh, let's look at what the consequences of this name are. So since we can't do copper iodide as our name, what we're going to do because that will give us two different formulas. What we need to do is incorporate into the name a Roman numeral that tells us the charge of that copper. So copper one iodide would be copper iodide where the copper has a plus one charge like shown above. If copper has a two plus charge we're going to name that uh, compound copper two iodide. Now recall if we had a formula say the poster child of ionic compounds NaCl remember that we name that as sodium chloride. Notice that I do not include a Roman numeral in that name because sodium will only have one charge ever. So we're only going to include our uh, Roman numerals with transition metals. So if we look back at our last slide here, so transition metals in green as well as tin and lead. Those are what you need to include those Roman numerals with. So I'm going to uh, show you a couple more examples. So let's say we have gold 3 chlorate. Gold is telling us right there in the name that it has a 3 plus charge. So that's pretty easy. We don't actually have to look at where it is on the periodic table. It's told to us right there. Chlorate, get out your list of polyatomic ions. That's a polyatomic ion and the formula is ClO3 minus. Now, in order for this to be a neutral compound, we're going to need three of those chlorates for every one of our gold. Uh, for those of you who are a fan of the crisscross method, that means that the three crosses over to our chlorate and the one crosses over to our gold. So we are left with one gold that is needed for every three chlorates. Since we need three chlorate, that ClO3 stays together. We put it in a parentheses and then we put the three at the end. I'd like you to give the next example a try, lead four carbonate. Pause the video, give it a try, and then I'll show you how to do it. Okay, so lead four carbonate. 
Lead four means that our lead has a four plus charge. Carbonate, if we look at our polyatomic ion list, has a two negative charge. So we have uh, to figure out how many of each we need. Now, if we just look at the charges, we see that it's a four plus charge and a two negative charge. In order for those charges to balance, we're gonna need two of these two negatives to balance out the four plus. Or if you rather, if you would prefer the cross cross method, either one's okay with me, you're going to end up with the same thing in the end. However, if you do the crisscross method, you're going to end up with something that looks like this. Remember, we have to put our parentheses around a polyatomic ion when we need more than one. You need to be able to recognize, if you are doing the crisscross method, that this two and the four are going to need to cancel out to give us one lead and just two of the carbonates. Let's do problem example four. Uh, notice that not all of these have Roman numerals. I'm starting to mix them up with the basic naming rules that we learned in the last video. So if there is no Roman numeral, that means you either have a normal metal that only has one charge, or you might have a polyatomic ion. So I want you to start seeing a lot of these examples mixed up with each other. Why don't you give these a try and press pause, and I'll give you the answer when you press play. Here are the answers. I want you to jot down any questions that you might have. We can discuss them in class when we go over all of these videos together. Now the opposite of this is going from the formula to the name. And when we did that in our basic rules video, it wasn't very hard. Uh, it's a little tougher when we have a transition metal involved. So I want to show you how I handle this. So our first example is CRF3. If we imagine that we have one CR and three Fs, we need to figure out what will lead to a neutral compound. So what I do is I set up a little bit of a math problem. You can do it whatever way you want. I'm gonna show you a couple ways that I do it. So uh, in this math problem, we have one chromium. We're gonna call that charge an X. And we're gonna add that for the three charges of each of the fluorines. Now I know that fluorine has a negative one charge and we know that those have to add up to zero. So what we have here is just a simple little algebra problem. X plus negative three is going to be zero. So our X is equal to a positive three. That means my chromium has a positive three charge. So I call it chromium three fluoride. So what we're doing is we're solving a little puzzle. We need to figure out what the charge of the chromium is. Let me show you a different way of approaching this problem. So through the magic of video editing, I just erased what I did, and I'm going to show you a different method that I use because everybody's brain works a little bit differently. This is more of a visual method for those of you that are more visual than mathematical. I draw a picture of all of the atoms involved. I have one chromium and three fluorines. My chromium, I don't know what the charge of that is, but I do know that my three fluorines have a negative one charge, and that adds up to a negative three. So I know that this needs to be equal and opposite, which is plus three, so I know that this individual atom has a plus three charge. You are welcome to use either of these methods. So let's look at our next example, because I think these need a couple explanations to get the hang of these. So let's look at the next one. Cu2CO3. The first thing you should recognize is that there's a polyatomic ion involved in this compound. CO3, that is carbonate. So we're going to have two coppers and one carbonate and they all need to add up to a zero charge. So if I'm taking my mathematical route, I have two times whatever the charge of my copper is plus my I only have one carbonate, not three, I have one carbonate. If I had three, it would be in parentheses with a three at the end. And I know that carbonate has a charge of negative two. So when I go to solve for that, two x minus two equals zero, x has a positive one charge. So I call this copper one carbonate. 
Now, if you wanted to take the visual route of this, I have two coppers and I have one carbonate. That one carbonate has a negative two charge. I know that my positive charge needs to cancel that out. So as a plus two charge, that means that each one of these needs to have a positive one charge. I'd like you to pause the video now and give the next one a try, SNHPO4. I want to warn you that the HPO4, that is a polyatomic ion. So why don't you look up that polyatomic ion right now and give this one a try. Press play when you think you have it. So this one is a little trickier just because the polyatomic ion seems to throw people off when there's that many atoms involved in the polyatomic ion. If you looked up the polyatomic ion, we see that it is HPO4, which is HPO4 2 minus, that's hydrogen phosphate. So if we have one of our tins and one of our HPO4 2 minus, our hydrogen phosphates, if this has a 2 minus charge and there's only one of them, and we only have one of our tins, we can then infer that our tin has a 2 plus charge to cancel out the 2 minus charge of that one polyatomic ion. So our name is tin hydrogen phosphate. I'd like you to give these four a try. Uh, you will need to notice uh, which ones of these you will need a Roman numeral for and which you won't need a Roman numeral for. I have mixed them up. So you're going to need to look at this uh, periodic table. Remember that if your metal is in the green or if it's tin or lead, you're going to need to include a Roman numeral. Otherwise, you do not include a Roman numeral. So give these four a try, pause the video, and when you think you have them, press play. Here are the answers. Notice that for D, I have included the answer with or without the Roman numeral. The reason for this is because silver is one of the two that I told you that commonly only has one charge. Silver and zinc, 99% of the time, will only have one charge. Silver having a plus one charge or zinc having a plus two charge. So I am flexible with whether you include a Roman numeral or not with those two, silver and zinc. The other exception that we need to talk about naming for is hydrates. A hydrate is an ionic compound whose crystal contains water molecules. So my favorite example is Epsom salts. Epsom salts are commonly used in uh, hot water soaks for when you have achy muscles. I'm a fan of Epsom salt soaks. And what that means is in an Epsom salt crystal itself, for every one magnesium sulfate formula unit, there are seven little water molecules crammed into that salt as well. And we denote this in the formula by drawing a dot, do you see that, that dot, and a number that goes before the water formula. And that number tells you how many water molecules are incorporated into your crystal. And this is how we name it. It's called magnesium sulfate. Well, that comes from the MgSO4, which I hope you uh, don't have a problem naming at this point. And then uh, to tell us about the hydration level, we say heptahydrate. The hepta denotes the seven. Hydrate denotes that there are water molecules within the crystal. Now, the number of water molecules uh, will be indicated by the prefix given here. So the number of water molecules can vary, and as you see, you can even have a half. Now, is there a half water molecule? No, that just means one water molecule for every two formula units. Uh, these prefixes are going to be used in uh, naming covalent compounds, so you're going to need to know these, so you might as well get to memorizing them right now. This example shows us calcium sulfate hemihydrate, which means you have half of a water molecule for every one formula unit. In nature, that means you have one water molecule for every two formula units. Here is barium chloride dihydrate. 
and magnesium hypobromide hexahydrate. So as you see, you only name the ionic compound normally, and then you add on the hydrate with its prefix, indicating the number of mo water molecules incorporated into the crystal.